Hi everyone, my name is Owen Mugabenawo and welcome to HYVA where I bring on successful entrepreneurs so we can learn from their challenges in business as well as their successes so that we can you know, take the ideas and you know remix it so that it works for us in our business and we can hopefully come back someday to talk to me and say how you did it based on the interviews that you've, you know, your, what you've learned from the guest. And today I have Mike Muni, CEO and founder of VIP Orbit Software. And also, he was uh, responsible for actually a co-founder and inventor of ACT, which was the uh, co uh, contact management software, you know, which eventually grew up and had about 10 million uh, people globally using it and eventually was bought by Symantec. And so today, I have you on the show, Mike. So first of all, let's introduce yourself to the uh, you know, uh, community. We'll get started from there. Well, thank you, Owen. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to, to be here. And... I, uh, I'm also honored to be asked by you, so thank you very much, personally. Um, yeah, I, I obviously made myself available to you to just share my story for what it may be worth to people. I, I didn't expect when I was in college uh, to become an entrepreneur. As a matter of fact, back in that era, I don't think I even knew the word. Uh, I was, I was uh, accepted to law school and had intended on being a lawyer for my career, uh, but I had a curveball thrown at me, and I, I was born and raised in Chicago, and I had to pay for my college education. I came from a poor family and the oldest of six kids, uh, so I worked as a laborer for a construction company, and uh, after I graduated from college, there was a concrete truck driver strike in Chicago, which is a strong union town, and uh, it shut construction down for over a month, so that month cost me the uh, ability to pay for my first year of law school, so I, I couldn't go. And in, in when the strike was settled, a friend of mine came up to me and said, have you ever thought about going into sales? And I said, no, why? And uh, he worked at IBM back in the mainframe here and said, well, I think uh, you might you know be able to interview and get a job at IBM if you're interested. So I did, thinking, well, okay, it's better than digging ditches. And uh, at the, in that era, I'm talking 1975, uh, I, you, you were uh, given a test. You had to pass an IQ test before they would interview you. I passed that test, and I probably just barely passed it. <laughs> um, I, but, I, but I passed it, and I was interviewed by six people over three days, and I was hired and had a very great career at IBM. I never expected to be in the computer industry, and here I am my entire career uh, helping people through hardware and software solutions. Much more the software uh, since the invention of ACT in 1986. It came on the market in 87. Um, so I've enjoyed it. I'm glad that, that there was a concrete truck driver strike in Chicago and I'm not the lawyer. <laughs> and, and definitely, and one of the things is, you know, I, I invited you here specifically to talk about, you know, some of the spectacular failures you've had in business. And that's one of the things that a lot of entrepreneurs don't like to admit. They always want to share the successes. And I'm curious, why? Why are you comfortable even sharing the failures you've had in business? Well, I, you know, I think when, you, when you're an entrepreneur, there's a lot of uh, characteristics one has right the the uh, willingness to take risks but also protecting the the illusion and image that you have to build when you're just starting out because nobody likes to be around anybody that looks desperate or is not succeeding so there is a a, a skin so to speak that a entrepreneur has to wear uh, to the public that they encounter and, and perhaps that's the reason why I think some people are just uh, arrogant and, and they think, you know, I'm not going to tell you anything that's wrong with me. If there's nothing wrong with me, which is not realistic. Uh, I've had a lot of failures in my life. As a matter of fact, Owen, at one time I thought about writing a book called uh, Fail to Succeed, which is a double, a double entendre, right? You, yeah. In order to succeed, you have to fail. So, no, I'm not, I'm not at all uh, embarrassed to tell you the mistakes I've made. I, I have failed. Uh, matter of fact, my very first entrepreneurial venture, I was with IBM for a number, quite a number of years, uh, but two other friends of mine and myself started our first entrepreneurial company uh, back in the early 80s uh, as a disaster recovery facility. So we had a mainframe that we had as a backup mainframe in that era. Again, the PC industry didn't exist yet. And we were trying to sell uh, backup services to big corporations. Let's say, for example, 
General Electric, what if you can't make payroll because your computer broke down? Yeah. Do you have a backup? And we were trying to sell fear, uncertainty, and doubt. We bought it from Sun, SunGuard, which was the nationwide disaster recovery facility company. They wanted to get rid of this one region in the country. We bought it for $1, and they subsidized us for six months. Yeah. And in that six months, uh, we tried to get people to subscribe to the service, and we never got one customer, and we had to shut down the business. I was in my uh, uh, late 20s, and I, I, you know, I really wasn't worried. I was a successful IBM salesman, so I just went back to the corporate world. But I tried. I, was I disappointed we failed? Yeah, we were undercapitalized. I mean, how, you can't expect to stay in business uh, longer than six months if you have no money. And we wouldn't have even been able to bought the business. It just happened at the right time. But that was the first effort. And, and it, was the reason why that business failed, I'm trying to get the reason for, for that. Was it because there was not enough capital to, 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 to manage the sales cycle that was involved? What was the reason yes. for that? Yeah, pretty much that's exactly right, Owen. The, uh, you know, Sun was very um, determined to just pay us for six months to subsidize us to get it off of their books. So we had a, a kind of a, a deadline, if you will. We had a, a drop dead date, six months or, or you're over with. And so there was a little bit of sense of desperation as that six months was approaching. We hadn't gotten our first customer to sign up. There was also a uh, a, a naivety and a reluctance from the IT department at that time to, to even worry about disaster recovery, right? That oh, nothing's ever going to happen. Our, our IBM computer is going to be fine. And so there was no urgency that they had to protect their company. Yeah. Right? Uh, but they didn't think of the user. I mean, if I'm a, a, a manufacturing line employee at General Electric and you don't pay me on payday, I'm going to shut you down, right? And and so we were trying to always argue on the side of you have to keep operations going, but there was no compelling reason for them to to say you're right. Let's uh, let me pay you and sign up right now. So we ran out of time, and we got more, but we got more desperate, and it showed. And people don't want to deal with desperate people, right? <laughs> so so we ourselves almost uh, invited the failure by by allowing ourselves to be desperate. Um, to back back to your earlier and first question, uh, why don't entrepreneurs talk about their failures? Uh, because that very thing I said, you can't appear to be desperate. If you do, you're going to fail, right? And that's what happened. Definitely. And so now you have this setback with the first company. And so move on. Was the next company uh, uh, Contact Software International? And, and was that <clears> how? You, how did you come about? You know the 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 software behind that, which was ACT. Tell me more about that story. Okay, let me tell you a story. I will. Uh, let me tell you a story that precedes that, though, because I'm, I'm asked, when did the idea really occur? When, did, when were you aware of that first time uh, the, the value of relationship management, contact management, whatever you may want to call it? And I didn't realize it at the time, Owen, but as I look back, I can tell you exactly when it happened. In 1978, working for IBM still, uh, selling mainframes, I, I had a prospecting territory, and I, this was on a Friday afternoon. I will never forget this encounter. I stopped in at a very big company, uh, a building the size of a Home Depot today, for example. Right? I thought certainly they they might uh, need a, an IBM computer for accounting, whatever. And I I went through my IBM story. I got to the executive assistant. She gave my business card to the CEO. He came out. Now, I'm in my mid-20s. I'm a young guy. He came out. He's probably in his 40s, 50s. Very handsome man, dressed in a suit and tie. And uh, I, I introduced myself. He said, Mike, I would love to talk to you and hear what IBM is doing in my industry, but I'm getting ready to go on a two-week skiing vacation in Colorado with my family. Feel free to call me when I get back. Okay, great. Have a good time. I went out to my car, Owen, and there were two things I wrote down. Uh, uh, three weeks later, I thought I'd give him a week to get back, right? I wrote down the executive assistant's name so I could address her by her first name and therefore be personable yeah. and friendly. And I wrote down, ask him how his skiing vacation went. Okay. Three weeks later, I called him up. I thought, you know, again, I would give him a week. Hi, Mr. Smith. This is Mike Muni, your IBM salesman. Oh, hi, Mike. First question out of my mouth. How was your skiing vacation with your family? 
a couple seconds of silence. I didn't know if I said something wrong or whatever. And he said, you know, you're probably a pretty smart guy working for IBM. Um, and you can probably figure that your competition has uh, been trying to sell me a computer too. And in fact, they all knew that I was going on the skiing vacation, just like I told you. And all of them have contacted me since I've been back. You're the last one. I'm going, oh, <laughs> my gosh. But wow. this is but this is the key. He said, but do you know you're the only one that asked me how my skiing vacation went? And I'm not pretending I quite got the import of what he was saying at that point, Owen. But what he said was, what that tells me is, you're a professional. You listen. What I said was important. I do not like to deal with amateurs, only professionals. So, yes, let's have that meeting. And I, we scheduled the meeting, and I ultimately sold him a computer system. Now, he might have bought an IBM computer anyway, but that, the asking him that personal question, Owen, was the thing that made the difference between me and my competition. And we all have competition. How do you distinguish yourself from your competition, right? I like to say there's no traffic jam on the extra mile. How do I get there where it's not crowded? Think of the pyramid. I'm all alone at the top. That's where I want to be, right? So from that example, now let's fast forward to your question, what was the idea for ACT? That was a big part of the idea for, uh, for what became ACT. The, the value of capturing detailed information about people and being personable. Um, so in 1986, we started a company called, my partner and I started a company called Conductor Software. And, and we wrote a, a program in Lotus Symphony at the time uh, that was a configurator designed specifically for computer retail stores. If you go back to the mid-80s, you may remember names like Computerland, Entree, MicroAge, Businessland, which looked like a never-ending business, right? And so we wrote a configurator product for the salespeople at those stores. Uh, and we, that product was designed for the stores. The owners had to buy it. Well, first of all, they were reluctant to buy anything because Lotus was giving them software. And we said, yeah, but that's that's because they want you to sell Lotus. We're not asking you to sell our product. This is for you to be profitable. And uh, so we raised $100,000 from an angel investor out of Boston, a friend of a friend of my brother's. $85,000 later, Owen, uh, we, we said to ourselves, this dog ain't going to hunt. We're dead. The product <laughs> failed, right? Why? There was, why? It was too expensive. It required uh, a dedicated computer to maintain the database of all of the inventory at the computer store. A lot of these computer store owners were brand new uh, business entrepreneurs for the first time, and they didn't know how to run their business nor realize the value of uh, tight inventory control, etc. cetera. Um, and it just wasn't a good fit. Uh, so, uh, it, so it failed. And it, it cost about $700 to buy that product. We charged uh, actually $795 per store, uh, which was a lot of money, right, at that time. Definitely. So, the other thing, too, is, I mean, looking back at how technology has come now with, with the ease of all this cloud-based technology where people can just easily integrate and, and, and make use of them. I'm thinking back then when you even had to sell the actual mainframe and system, an entrepreneur who doesn't even have any kind of technological background, like, man, this is extra exactly. work. So exactly. you had that milestone you had to climb over and convince them on, I guess. That's exactly right. And the reason we wrote this configurator program is because, and this is what we said, yesterday their salespeople were selling washers and dryers at Sears. Today they're selling computer technology for businesses. They don't even know about margins and margin control and back salva margin, line item and discount. How do I be? How do I stay profitable without without uh, giving the store away? And that's what we wrote this program for to make and to print it out a configuration. So if you came in, Owen, and said I work for Texas Instruments and my department, I need 15 computers and five printers and well, we would print out that configuration, and it would be guaranteed to make a profit uh, for you because we would make sure you couldn't go below certain numbers, uh, and I would print it out and give it to you. You would then go to another computer store, and the salesperson there would say, oh, that's probably going to be you know X amount of dollars, uh, give or take $10,000, whatever. Well, that didn't look as professional as my store where I gave you a hard copy and said, we'll, we'll honor this price for 30 days. 
right? It was always about professionalism and profitability. <clears throat> so despite the good intentions, we still failed. So one of the uh, uh, computer chains across the country that I had been trying to sell this product to, the name of the product was called Margin Maker. Uh, I, I met the CEO of the company that had 54 stores across the country that was headquartered here in Dallas, a gentleman by the name of John Pertell. And John never bought the product, but he liked me. And so when, when my partner and I decided that the that, that, uh, margin maker was a failure, I went to John and I said, what should we do? And he said, you two guys are uh, pretty smart guys. Why don't you take a brainstorming breakfast on July 4th, 1986? So what is that? Almost 25 years ago, right? Definitely, yeah. Yeah. Uh, in in, a, in two, day, uh, two days, three days, uh, 25 years ago. And he said, why don't you take pencil and paper and just sit and brainstorm and see if you can come up with something. So we did. At 8 o'clock on, on July 4th, 1986, we went to a Holiday Inn restaurant uh, south of Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. And, and uh, it was at that breakfast we began to say to each other, so what do we really know? What, what, could, we, what could we use ourselves? Uh, what do people need? I mean, you started asking questions and dreaming. And so uh, at one point it occurred to us, well, as a salesperson with computers available now in this brand new thing called the laptop, I'd love to have everything I know about people and their details, etc. So go back to that IBM story, the executive assistant's name, and remember that somebody went on a vacation and to ask them about it. So we, so we on the paper, and I still have the paper at my house today, uh, is the first... Um, emergence of the menu line where it was where act was conceived at that breakfast July 4th 1986 by the end of that breakfast though and we knew we were on to something we were excited I mean we just know wow we're we think we hit on something so uh, we set out over the course of the next few weeks to design the product to design what became act and uh, and you know I had to raise more money my partner and I you know went about talking to people to raise more money we the the original investor he came down for a meeting the, t the board meeting for the three of us right and his name was john mcnair and uh we told him john we have bad news you know what's that um margin maker failed and we only have we only have fifteen thousand dollars left and he kind of shook his head he was a very mild-mannered guy and we said but we have another idea that we want to talk to you about and show you because we had done a little bit of a prototyping on the screen, right? And when we were done showing it to him, he said, I really like what I see. He said, I didn't invest in Margin Maker. I invested in the two of you. Wow. And, and if the two of you uh, tell me that Margin Maker is dead and you think that this could be a bigger hit, I'm backing you. Do you need more money? And, and I don't, I don't want to stop you and to, 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 to stop your train of thought, but there's several questions that just boiling in my head that I have to ask. Because at the time when you said two different stories now of two different failures that happened, but you guys didn't stop. I mean, I mean, was, was that not the situation you guys said, is, is this entrepreneurship thing for me? I mean, like, what was different for you guys that you, you saw the need to still continue? And the second part of that question is, what exactly did the investor see in you after you ended up losing up his money eventually to say, okay, I, I didn't invest in the idea, I invested in you guys. What was that thing he saw? I, I just need those answers. I'm sorry. Yeah, you know, and I'll do the best I can, Owen, to answer him because there's so many dynamics in it and intangibles in, in how you trust another person, your impression of that person. Do I believe him or not? Do they have a good idea? You know, just... All of that comes together. It's in a crucible, if you will, right? And and how it's boiling determines what it's going to, when it's done cooking, what it's going to look like. It's the best way I can describe it. We Were we afraid uh, that we were going to have to shut down the business? Absolutely. I mean, it was fun to work together. We were best friends. We, it, we didn't like the corporate world anymore. It was nice to be our own boss. If I, you know, you, you work long hours as an entrepreneur, but don't, you know, for sure, but if I had to, uh, uh, you know, delay going into the office, our little office, until 10 o'clock in the morning, I didn't have to tell a boss that I was going to be late, right? I was my own boss. But I was also working at 10 o'clock at night at home, right? And on weekends. But it was just fun to be in, char in control of my own life. 
And I think part of it is uh, entrepreneurs, especially a first-time entrepreneur, has to have a little bit of naivety. They just have to be blind to so many things. And it's like a racehorse, right? You have to have blinders on and you're not worried about all this other stuff. You can't afford to because it will kill you. Uh, you can't, we didn't analyze the market on is there a market for this product that became Act. We didn't know. We didn't have the money and we didn't have the time to, to, to run a spreadsheet analysis and figure out, well, what if this, what if that? We just said, you know what? I myself need a product like this. And that's the point I saw in that is that you built something that you knew you had need for. Right. And that's, and that's key. So our mindset was always uh, uh, thinking like the user because we were users. And what we did, we were both sales guys. And you say, well, what do two sales guys know about developing software and becoming a software company? <laughs> the answer is we didn't know anything about that. What, what, what difference did that make? <laughs> if that made a difference, we couldn't have done it. But it's, it's interesting because a number of people along the way, when we began to talk to some people to raise money, said that's exactly what they said. What do you two guys know? You're just sales guys. And they tried to push us down. And, and, and we had to learn to just say, damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead. Obviously, that person's not interested. We're still going. There's got to be more people that believe in us and are willing to fund us. So and we did. We, found people, we were passionate. They liked us. We had a likability factor. They liked the idea, uh, the idea. There was this new technology called the laptop. Obviously, people were buying PCs and laptops. They were going to put something on it, more than just spreadsheets and word processors. Putting uh, contact information on it sure seemed like a good idea. And so all of those components, Owen, came together, and it allowed us to uh, to proceed before we succeeded, right? And what, what I'm just trying to summarize what you just said. There was the fact that there was the passion. Being, you guys wanted to create your own lifestyle and your own destiny, so that passion right. was there. Hence, you want to build a successful business from it. Besides the passion, there was the fact that you had need for what you were building. So right. You were the user. And the third right. fact was that the timing was correct. Those three things blend together. And, and so go ahead. You were talking about how you now told him about the software and he's you know, interested in, in ACT. Let's take it from there. Okay, so um, the the original investor, uh, you know, when he said, I, I, I invested in you two guys, he gave us more money, which bought us a little bit more time to continue to raise more money. So John Pertel, the man who I mentioned earlier, I went to and, and said, we're failing, what should we do? And he's the one that said, have this breakfast on July 4th. He became the second investor because he liked that idea better than the other one that I'd been trying to sell him on. And he became the chairman of the board of the company for the entire life of the company until we sold it to Symantec in 1993. So, that, so, so now we were underway. We employed a concept called, uh, my partner and I, called useful use. In other words, he, rep he and I represented the world. And so if, if I came up with an idea... I had to persuade him that it, w it should go into the product called ACT. Uh, again, we hadn't named it yet. Um, and if he came up with the idea, he had to persuade me that it was worth having in the product. And if I said, no, I don't like it, it didn't go in. If he didn't like something I said, it didn't go in. And that way we controlled each other. We contained the things that were only most valuable to a user, us. Okay. So we called that useful use. And... That, that principle of useful use we applied throughout the life of ACT is, until we sold the company. Um, I had codenamed ACT before. I'm the one that came up with the name ACT, which was an acronym to begin with. It stood for Activity Control Technology. I came up with it on a flight home from New York City to Dallas because somebody challenged me, you better come up with a name real quick. <laughs> but the, the code name for the product was YES uh, with an exclamation mark, and it stood for YES. Everybody sells. Everybody sells. A doctor, a lawyer, a CPA. Who doesn't deal with people? You yeah. know, you're, you're interviewing right, me right now. I'm in the process of selling you my story. You're in the process of selling the value of this story to your listeners, right? Definitely. So everybody sells all the time. And so we purposely chose to not call the product uh, uh, whatever, the, the sales manager, we didn't want the word sales in there because we didn't want a, a CPA walking by and saying, uh, well, it, it says sales and I'm a CPA, so it's not for me, yeah. right? 
we were trying to appeal to a, 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 what we saw was a huge market opportunity. And, and obviously, history proved us right. We did. Definitely. So, so then, uh, you know, over time, uh, obviously, we expanded. But the competitive pressures mounted with Microsoft at that time announcing a product called Schedule Plus, which became Outlook. But we were a one-product company, right? We had won the, you know, numerous times the PC Magazine Editor's Choice Award. We won over 100 awards with that. And uh, but but it was time to consider uh, should we see if somebody's interested in buying us, and we we uh, partly because of the competitive threats. So we put out an offering memorandum. We hired an investment banker out of Silicon Valley, and there were three companies that responded right away: CompuServe, which at the time was the number one. Oh, uh, they are they are today what Yahoo or then what Yahoo is today, for example, right? Yeah. Or Google. Uh, AOL was just this little company that really had just gotten started. So CompuServe, WordPerfect, and Symantec. <coughs> Excuse me. So we played poker. Uh, when you when you put yourself up for sale, oh, and you play poker, and we played poker. And uh, you had asked me earlier before the show started. Uh, would I mind telling the uh, financial story of the sale? And I said, sure. So the here's one thing. Uh, w when we hired the investment banker out of Silicon Valley, the person assigned to our account, the technical person, was a Harvard MBA. And you go, whoa, Harvard, MBA, smart person. And he was a smart <laughs> person. Right? He had done his MBA analysis and said, uh, at most, you guys can get $25 million for your company, at most. And when he said that, and the salesperson of the company was next to him, we said, if that's what you believe, you're fired. <laughs> because we were doubling in revenue every year. That year that we sold, we were $22 million in revenue. Yeah. The, year, the year before, we were 11 The year before that, we were 5 We were doubling every year. So we didn't have to sell the company, and we weren't going to sell out of desperation, right? So we, when, when he said, oh, no, stop, well, don't, don't fire us, we said, okay, but you better get more than $25 million, or at least believe you can. So make a long story short, Owen, we flew out. Symantec said, we, we'd like to talk. We've analyzed the numbers. We want to make you an offer. So my partner and I flew out to Cupertino. Uh, they wined and dined us the night before, the best wine I've ever had in my life, probably. And uh, the next day in their boardroom, they said, after all the analysis, $20 million. $20 million. Now, the Harvard MBA was with us, and he looked at us. You know, he, It was like, see, I told you. I told you, yeah. Told you, right? But we didn't pay any attention to him because my partner and I on the plane trip out there we hadn't done any analysis we said what would we sell the company for what's what's the right number and we said 40 million dollars 40 million that's it so what we said to Symantec is that your best offer and they said yeah and we said you're not even in the ball game that's exactly what we said you're not even in the ball game um, so we went back home and two weeks later, they called us and said, we've redone the numbers. Can you guys come back out? So, sure, you took us out to a great restaurant before. We'll come back out again. <laughs> so we went out in another great restaurant. The next day, we're in the boardroom, and, uh, and uh, they, they tried to build up the excitement, right? And they, uh, the moment of truth came. They said, we've redone the numbers. We want to offer you $22 million. For all that? <laughs> yeah. I, I, feel like, I feel like I'm looking back, oh, and it's like uh, Austin Powers where well, the evil, uh, you know, um, whatever, I forget his name now, says $1 million, right? It's like yeah. we said to him, is that your best offer? And they said, yes. And we said, do you remember last time, only two weeks ago, we told you you weren't even in the ball game, in the ballpark, excuse me. And they said, yeah, but uh, $2 million is a lot more. And we said, it's not even close. So we literally shook hands and flew back home. A month and a half later, we get a call from them. And they wanted us to come out. And we said, we don't want to come out again. Why don't we just have your board and our board will have a, 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 con a teleconference. Yeah. Okay, so the moment of truth came. And they said, we've redone the numbers. The number is $39.5 million. Now, keep in mind, my partner and I said $40 million was the number, right? 
So we we uh, we said, well, we want to put the phone on mute and, and and talk to the board members and see what everybody thinks. So uh, I was the first one. I said, okay, we wanted forty. Uh, what's half a million? Okay, I'm in. Right, let's do it. And everybody else agreed. Let's do it. So we got back on the phone and said, we accept your offer. And they started, oh, yay, yay, clapping, right? And we said, except there's one condition. Well, what's the condition? We want to put a collar on this deal. Uh, 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 like, think of a shirt collar. We want to put a collar on this because we think when you announce the acquisition of ACT to Wall Street that your stock price is going to go up. Now, at that time, they had 25 million shares outstanding and it was trading at $13.25 a share, okay? So here's what we said. We want this deal to be valued 30 days from today, whatever your stock price is, and we get uh, a portion of that. We get 7% more of that value, whatever that is. How did you even know to create this deal? Was this something you guys have seen someone else do and you just did it on uh, yours? It, the investment banker said, Symantec stock price has been hovering closer to the lower end than the high end. They had had a huge drop over the previous year, right? So we thought, okay, there, let's take a, it was being entrepreneurial. Let's take some more risk here. We think we're going to win. Could we lose? Yeah. Yeah. I think we're going to win. So we said, they, they told us, put a collar on it and, and make it be a, a deal based on their future stock price. Okay, fine. We, we bought the, uh, the, the rationale. So Symantec said, well, you know, we've never done that before. You're the 13th company we've bought, but okay, sure, fine. And, and we put a collar on it. So uh, that was May 3rd, 1996. So the stock, the value of the sale was based on the June 3rd price, whatever that price was going to be. Within four days of them announcing the acquisition, their stock price went up $4 a share. Wow. Four, four times 25 million means that they were worth 100 million more. Now, in today's billion market where Zynga, you know, yeah. is, uh, you know valued at $60 billion or whatever it is, it's ridiculous. Uh, Facebook, $100 billion. Okay, I know it doesn't sound like much, but back then, <laughs> 1993, this was prior to the Internet starting, right? Yeah, that's uh, to a lot the of money. Market. Yeah, that was a lot of money. So. That stock price floated up and down over the 30 days, but 30 days later, it closed exactly four dollars higher, so 17 and a quarter. Because of that, we got an extra seven million dollars, seven and a half actually. So uh, we, we we closed the deal for 47 million dollars, and their first offer was for 20. And the Harvard MBA said we would only get 25 at best. We were sales guys. Sales guys are always selling, right? <laughs> we never stop selling. And we believed in the product and we had that passion and we didn't have to sell. We were not desperate, right? And so that's how we closed the deal. Wow, that, that, that is an awesome story. And the, the, the business model at that point was this selling of software. You send out this, the, the software CDs to them and they install in their computer. It's not like today where they do it over the cloud, right? Correct. There was, yeah, there was no cloud. There was no internet. They would shrink wrap software as it was called, right? So you'd go to the store and you'd physically have a a box and uh, go home with the manual that nobody ever read and the and, the, and this you know the the discs uh, etc and install it yourself that was the era we were in and, 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 yeah. and we've, we've heard the, the, the great part of the story but I'm sure in, in in the whole process of you running act there were some failures that come to mind that you feel might be used for our audience to listen to and, and, and learn from that as well any come to mind yeah, uh, the most unfortunate one, or, or one of the most unfortunate ones, was because of the success of ACT, uh, my partner and I lost our best friendship. Oh. The, the friendship was replaced by the, the business uh, attention and the difference of opinion. And you know what, I, I, I've spoken often to uh, audiences, and I, I lecture at uh, universities to MBA uh, the years, and I say to them, which is harder to deal with, success or failure? And invariably, you know, most of them, you know, work around to finally saying success, but they start out saying failure. And I said, I always say, failure is easy to deal with. There's only upside. <laughs> the hardest thing to deal with is success because now the spotlight is on you. Your ego can get strong. You have this overconfident attitude. You have differences of opinion with other people. You're the expert. They're not. 
you know, you're, you're attended to by other people, journalists, etc., conferences that want you to be a speaker. All of a sudden, you have this attention, and attention causes stress and, is, and a sense of self-importance. And I'm not going to deny that, you know, I have uh, an ego. I do. Uh, so did my partner. But those egos uh, caused us to disagree more. And that disagreement caused us to lose our friendship, our best friendship. And so that's an unfortunate, uh, you know, consequence of the success of ACT that very few people know about. Wow. So you hear that. But the thing, too, is I guess because of success, it kind of amplifies, you know, certain things that might not have been shown when, when, when you guys were you know, still struggling and trying to make this idea work, you know, but when the success comes, it amplifies everything that was hidden. And so, you know, friction really shows a lot at that point. Yeah. I mean, other than that, um, I also lost a, a 19 year marriage, right? The, the pressure of being in the inventor, co-inventor and traveling and speaking, I couldn't delegate that. Uh, I lost touch with my family and I tell the students, and when, again, when I, when I lecture to MBAs, I tell them, look, if you want to be an entrepreneur, I support that. I, I'm one. I'm glad I have been one. Yeah. But understand that that whatever your vision is, is going to become your mistress. You will think about it all the time. You will stroke it. It will stroke <laughs> you. You will, you will go to sleep thinking about it. You will wake up thinking about it. You will devote every waking hour to trying to survive and succeed. And, and in doing so, you may lose touch with the, the people who are closest to you right now. Don't take anything for granted. I did. Oh, and so I lost a marriage and I lost uh, a, a best friend. So sorry to hear that, but I'm sure there is lessons that you've learned from that point and so that entrepreneurs who are listening can figure out, okay, yes, you still have the idea, but how can you, for, for the business, but how can you know that that idea is only meant to enhance the relationships with people that you, you, you love and you, you that are most valuable to you? So what lessons learned from that very point that you just made can we apply in our business as we try to be successful <clears throat> but not lose touch? Uh, well, obviously, uh, the family was the biggest loss. The marriage was the biggest loss. So you, you have to uh, leave the uh, energy uh, for the business and the idea uh, parked at the side when you get home. Uh, you, you have to realize that although you're dedicated to this vision you know, every waking hour, your family is not. Their family life is continuing on. The kids have you know, sicknesses, they've got teacher conferences, they've got their sports events. You can't make an excuse that bi your business is always more important than those little things that are priceless and precious. And, and what it is, is it's a slow, uh, it's a slow erosion that you have to recognize early on before it gets too late. And I didn't recognize it early on, uh, that you have to stop and say, you know what, the business is still going to exist tomorrow. My idea is not going away. I can devote this evening and this weekend a Saturday to my family. Okay. Wow. My so wife just earned a new a weekend of full attention to her because I I, <laughs> I want to learn from this and just go give her the full attention. And I guess that's where the whole idea of you know the, the whole lifestyle design is coming from where a lot of entrepreneurs have understood now that you know the success is great but the business is not really meant to just be about the monetary aspect or just the fame or the success. It's really meant to drive a lifestyle you want to live and if that lifestyle you can't drive because of the business then it's kind of like oh yeah you're not in in a job but you're kind of slave to the business otherwise the business is supposed to be a vehicle working for you to get closer and closer to the lifestyle and the people you want to share your life with well i, I like how you made that point concrete to me in this you know, part of the interview and and moving yeah, forward so, go ahead so go ahead. people i'm sorry and so people say wow you succeeded you sold contact software act for 47 million dollars and blah 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 yeah, that's that's great, uh, but let's net that out, because when you do you deduct the value of a marriage and you deduct the value of a of a best friendship, now it's not a gross equal net success story. It's a lot less than you might imagine because you can't put a price tag on on the losses I incurred, right? Totally so what right. is it to make what is it to make money, but to lose the very purpose and joy for which you were doing it all along to begin with, right? So you have to learn to balance things in your life. I lost. 
I, I'm losing you. And I, I can hear you. Uh, we had issue with Skype. What, what was the last point you made? You said you lost. Sorry about that. I, I lost balance. I lost balance going back to knowing when to turn off and to turn on the business and my energy each, right? Definitely. And, and that's so, a so good point. I'm going to figure out how to do that for my own self too because it's something I'm also running into an issue with my wife and loved ones and trying to figure out how to. And, and that's a good, just hearing that from you is really emphasize the point that I need to form that balance. And moving on in the story, you now got the success, you know, uh, I guess monetary success with the sell of act, you decided to take a, a haters and, you know, a rest and come back into business. I, I guess the next one was it cele Celebrity Soft? Yeah, I started a company. I invested in uh, the Michael Jordan Golf Company. Now, keep in mind at that era, Michael was playing for the Chicago Bulls and he had, he was you know, athlete in the whole world. They recognized everywhere he went and <clears throat> there was a small group of people who uh, nine of us actually that, that invested in the Michael Jordan Golf Company that was uh, the idea from an entrepreneur who used to work for Jack Nicholas, the golfer. And I know that Michael Jordan loves to play golf. So I invested and as a result I was able to meet Michael Jordan uh, and be around him a few times. And one of the events was the grand opening of the very first Michael Jordan Golf Center in, in Aurora, Illinois. So here I am, this huge crowd, I mean massive crowd of people, police there to uh, secure Michael when he arrived. And Michael drives up in his Porsche and gets out of the car. And even the policemen surrounded him like they forgot that they were there to protect him. <laughs> they, like everybody else, were just awed by being in the presence of Michael Jordan. I literally, when I was standing there watching this unfold, though, and I said to myself, there must be an opportunity here to, to create a company. I want to uh, uh, create a, a game company with Michael Jordan. Now, you, most people don't know that era, uh, Electronics Arts NBA game, uh, if you had the Chicago Bulls team, uh, Michael Jordan did not exist. There were only two NBA players back then who did not license their image to the NBA and to the game. And that was Michael Jordan and Shaquille O'Neal. So Michael, to me, was a free agent. And if I, could, if I could come up with a game idea for him and secure him as my first um, uh, candidate, and character, I would exclusively have him. That was a unique proprietary opportunity, and I thought, I'm going to do something. And so I began to put together a, a, a vision and a company called Celebrity Soft, where I was going to take already branded uh, professional athletes, and I was going to create a, a real uh, fun game around them, not in the sport that they were doing, though. So this wasn't Michael Jordan in basketball. That's boring. That doesn't take any creativity. Yeah. Michael loves, Michael loves golf, so I was going to create a, uh, a, a drama, action-packed, uh, fantasy golf game where the golf ball was going to go uh, on the first hole down into the middle of the earth and there were going to be clay people and, and they, the golf clubs are going to have to become weapons and you're going to have to fight your way uh, uh, underneath the, the surface of the earth and to, to finish this golf game. It's fantasy golf. And I was going to call it uh, Michael Jordan's Domination Nation. The next game was going to be Domination Universe, Domination Galaxy. That you know, There was a long yeah. list. Because Michael in his book said, if you don't compete against me, I will dominate you. So I thought, okay, Michael Jordan's domination. So I built up the business plan, and it had a lot of unique qualities to it, Owen. Uh, so I, I uh, was going to have a Willy Wonka concept where there were going to be five golden certificate winners in the product that, uh, that would be in their box. And those five winners could bring one friend, like Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory, and spend a day with Michael. I was this now. This was in 1998. I was doing this right, and uh, 1990 era. Um, so the internet was a new thing. I was going to have an internet scoreboard for people playing online. This new thing called online, and they and five of their friends, a total of 20 people, right? And and, and all of Michael's sponsors: Gatorade, McDonald's, Nike. Jockey underwear, Oakley sunglasses, all of them are going to contribute 
uh, gifts to the winners. And MTV was going to record this and show it on MTV, Pat O'Brien. I spoke with Pat O'Brien. Uh, so, and, and it was going to sell the game. Nike Town. Nike doesn't sell software, but they were going to sell it because they owned Michael Jordan as, this, as one of his main sponsors, right? So I, I created this proprietary vision and was, I was going to embed Michael Sponsor's logos in the game in exchange for their paying for that advertising right so I wouldn't have to raise equity and sell parts of the company. I gave Michael 33 and a third percent of the company. I just gave it to him because, and I thought with the, with the two thirds left for me, there's plenty of room to make a lot of money here, right? Yeah. Uh, contractually, I only had eight hours a year of Michael's time. That's basically nothing, not even two golf games, That's <laughs> right? But I didn't care. I didn't care. I, Michael was the golden, uh, you know, goose lane, uh, you know, uh, creature. And so I would be able to leverage uh, being a partner with him. And he, he would give me access to people on my own I would never have access to. It turned out that Michael Jordan... Um, did nothing to help me. Zero. Um, uh, I went after Charles Barkley as my second candidate, and I got Charles Barkley on my own, and I gave Charles 5% to the company. So Michael and I were diluted 5% each. Uh, because of this excitement and Michael Jordan's agent, David Falk, David talked to Muhammad Ali's agent, David Mitchell, and I got a call one day from David Mitchell saying, I'd like Muhammad Ali to be one of your uh, characters in a game. And so all of this was unfolding. I was going to have John Romero, the inventor of Doom, which at the time was the number one action game. He's, he lives here in Dallas too, so I met with John Romero. John and his team of uh, game creators were going to write the game of my vision, right? So I had everything lined up. I had Ross Perot Jr. wanted to put in $3 million to the game. Now, this was taking place over a period of 18 months. I flew up to be with Michael Jordan's agent a number of times in Chevy Chase, Maryland. I guess I was in Maryland, but Chevy Chase, yeah. uh, um, David Falk, fame. Uh, I pulled out of my file. I, I know your listeners can't see it, but look at this. Yeah, I oh, can see so there, Definitely. Yeah, so there's the fame uh, letter from David Falk saying that the, and Michael and other players of his would be ca uh, candidates to uh, have games created for them by Celebrity Soft. So everything was going well until 18 months later, I got a call from David Falk, and he said, Michael doesn't, uh, my, I said, I have bad news for you. What is it, David? He said, Michael doesn't want to do this anymore. Why not? He's not interested in sweat equity. He wants cash. And I said, David, do you understand? We could take this company public uh, because of the uh, global branding that uh, amongst all these athletes, especially Michael, and create something that doesn't exist right now in the game community. Yeah. And he, and, but Michael, it didn't matter to Michael. Where is my money? Right? <laughs> Go ahead. Right? And um, and so it, it was it was over. And there were two other companies Michael had sweat equity in too. And David had to call them and tell them Michael's not going to do anything with you because he doesn't want sweat equity. Uh -huh. uh, so that ended the business after 18 months. During that 18 months, Owen, I kept pressing, let's, when is Michael going to sign the contract? And I kept being assured by David Falk that, oh, we're, we're working on Michael. He's, he's assured us that everything is going to be fine. He just wants one more question answered. And, and I, got, I got played out over time. And the contract never got signed, but I was told, no, continue to proceed. I would say, David, we don't have a contract. Is it okay to continue to go the next step and start raising some money? Oh, yeah, uh, Michael's going to sign it, right? So it never happened, Owen, so I had no recourse. When Michael made a decision he didn't want to be involved anymore, which he wasn't really involved anyway, it was, it was done. And that, that, so I had to shut that down. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, Charles Barkley at the time wasn't a... Uh, a marketing, a strong enough marketing brand to entice investors to help me build this company. Because building a game is very expensive, very, very expensive. <coughs> so I failed. So, you know, I, I had two failures, right? The, the computer disaster recovery business, uh, Margin Maker, the, the one success was ACT. 
here I, I uh, now fail with celebrity sauce. So I'm I'm, I'm uh, batting two fifty, right? I'm one for four. <laughs> and, and I'm curious though, what was now that you look back at, at what was the key lesson point from that that you felt made you fail in that business of celebrity soft? I, I uh, okay. Uh, again, I'm uh, I'm an ordinary person, Owen. I I'm not used to being around people that have a lot of zeros after their name and all of the glory and attention and perks that professional athletes are given. And I was I was uh, part of a crowd that was. Uh, a, a crowd I was not used to being around, and I was an insignificant person. You know, they're used to the the big multi-million dollar endorsements every year. You know, I mean, look at the quarterbacks today, a hundred million dollar contracts for six years. I mean, the money that they're used to is beyond comprehension for most most people. And so if you don't step up to that level of uh, familiarity with them, you're pretty much not uh, very important. And, and so my belief, I was blinded by my belief in my vision. And I wasn't accustomed to dealing with people that are used to all these zeros at the end of their name. And I didn't hold firm on getting Michael to sign the contract before I took the next step. I, I suppose looking back that maybe I didn't persist in getting it closed because if it never happened, I wouldn't be able to continue the pursuit of my dream because it was fun to be thinking about this game and all these professional athletes I was going to be able to hang around and, you know, build up and be a success again as a software entrepreneur in the game industry. I, I, you can get blinded even, even as an entrepreneur. And, I, and as I look back, I think those were the components, Owen, that caused me to fail. But the number one reason, that the, the thing that collapsed it, was that because I didn't have a contract with Michael and he could just say, oh, I'm not interested anymore, with no regard to all the work I had put into it and all the passion and all the meetings with his agent, it didn't matter. Uh, you know, it just didn't matter. It was all about money. Definitely. And I learned, I'm learning a lot from the, the, the failures we'll talk about this specifically. And just so that the audience can understand, you know, when you're talking about something like this, there's two sides to every story. So this is your own side of it. Hopefully, another yeah. day we can get Michael Jordan, hopefully, on the show. And he talks about his own side and we can learn from that. So this is all allegedly at this point, but we're trying to learn from the story. But not only that, too, uh, now let's move forward to what you're currently doing. And I want to learn, you know, what exactly... Where did, where did that need for what you're currently doing, which is a VIP orbit? Where did that yeah, come from? Yeah, good question. Yeah, no, thank you for asking. Um, okay, so um, I, I closed, you know, Celebrity Soft down in the 1998, and Deloitte Consulting hired me to, to be one of their global, uh, three global CRM uh, spokesmen because ACT created the category called contact management, which created the CRM industry, which is a multi-billion dollar a year industry. And, and one of the CRMs I like these days is high rise. Just so yeah. that people know that I love that software. But go ahead with your story. Okay. All right. So, so ACT was the product that kind of brought awareness to having relationship management software to help people not only deal with more, but more people more effectively, right? And so I was uh, enjoyed time working at, at uh, Deloitte Consulting for a while. Uh, worked for a couple other companies that recruited me away from Deloitte. Uh, but in 2004, I abandoned Windows. I got tired of Windows. And when I abandoned Windows, I abandoned my own baby, Act, which I had used all that time. Excuse me. Um, and I went to Apple. I bought my first Apple uh, desktop. Fast forward to 2007, the iPhone came out. I bought the iPhone, and I got used to, on my Mac desktop, continued with my phone, I got used to the iCal calendar, built-in calendar, and the phone, the phone list, right? But neither one of those, as we all know, whatever phone you use, neither one of those components are integrated, and they're separate, isolated things. So, uh, but that was fine. In 2009... November of 2009, I was sitting at my house, and I, I'm subscribed to Business Week magazine. And the cover story, uh, November 2009, was apps, this huge economy that was opening up because of these new things called apps. And when I got done reading that article, Owen, I, I won't describe to you <laughs> what I said to myself because it's very colorful language, but I basically said, I can't believe nobody has addressed the mobile market yet 
in the contact management field or the CRM field. And, and, the, and so many of us are neglected. So since they haven't done it, I'm going to do it. I've done it before with ACT. I created a market. Uh, I'm going to do it again because I, as a user, that goes back to my being a user. I uh, wanted key, more yeah. Robust, user, yeah. robust productivity out of my phone because my phone, the iPhone to me was becoming the computer. And today is the computer. It's one of a few kind of computers I have. But the thing about the phone is it's with me 24-7. So it's the most important computer, right? And so I set about to start another company. And in my research, here's what I came up with. I said, uh, what, I, what I compiled was, if you add up the big six, as I call them, uh, Siebel Oracle CRM, uh, Microsoft CRM, and Salesforce, and then on the contact management side, ACT, Goldmine, and Maximizer, the base of those huge companies is only 12 million users. Sorry about that. Uh, the, I, I kind of lost what you said can you repeat that you said uh, the companies before the 12 million uh, users okay there were six I, there were six uh, companies that pretty much dominate the, the CRM and contact management market salesforce.com Microsoft CRM and uh, Oracle formerly known as Siebel Goldmine and Maximizer combined globally there's only 12 million people in the whole world using contact management and CRM systems. That's nothing compared to what Forrester, the research firm, said by the end of this year, there will be 1.4 billion smartphone users and 100 million tablet users for a product that didn't even exist a year ago, right? Wow. <laughs> so that's, that's a total of 1.5 billion devices, and let's say those 12 million contact management and CRM users have one of those devices. Okay, so let's deduct 12 million. It still leaves 1.48 billion devices out there. And let's cut up, let's say, okay, but not everybody is going to ever think about relationship management on their smartphone or, or tablets. Fine, so let's uh, deduct a, a, a billion. That leaves me four and a half, uh, uh, 400 million people still. So let's cut that in half, Owen. Oh, now, now we're down to 250 million. That is still 20 times the size of the existing vendors taking care of only 12 million people. So that is a neglected market, and that was my vision. Most people go over here, oh, there's more opportunity for something established, not me. They left us over here vacant and neglected. I'm going over here while they're running over there, right? So I want to go where nobody has gone before. I do want to be a pioneer. I know the cost is high. I know the obstacles are great. I know the likelihood of failure is probably more intense than I even want to think about, right? But I'm not afraid of it because if you don't, if you want to explore, you have to leave the shore and go out into the ocean and explore. You have to do that. And so I, I wanted to leave the shore and say, I want to appeal to the mass market of consumers now, who I call prosumers, the professional business person who's also a consumer, yeah. that already that I, activity like I do as a user. There have got to be more people me to do more and want to connect all this. So with VOrbit, I put together the and I, I assembled the, the best of the team members from the ACT era to, to join with me in the company. Uh, uh, and I, I know you're saying some really good stuff right now, but when this happens with the bandwidth with Skype, I always have to pause so that we can catch up because this is good stuff I want my audience to, to, to catch on. And so continue from that point. I think we have, we, we have not caught up back. Sorry about that. Just continue. Okay. Where where do you want me to start from again? From I'm the sorry. point where the point where you said that you figured out there was a market where nobody was untapped and you wanted to go to something where everybody was not looking at because you want to be first in the market. That was the point we started having the Yeah, and I said if you really want to explore and voyage into new territory, you have to leave the shore. Think of a boat. You've got think of Christopher Columbus, right? He he had to leave the shore and go over an unknown ocean to discover something where nobody else had discovered something yet. 
uh, or attend to it in my case. So, so I, uh, I made a choice to go in a very uh, undeveloped area. Uh, people who are never likely to think about contact management or relationship management, they're happy with their phone. They think it does everything. I know that at some point, though, many of those people are going to realize this has become more of my computer. It is with me all the time. I want it to do more. I do want it to do a spreadsheet. I do want it to do a little bit of a document. I, you know, I, I, Not that you can do it well, but I want everything with me in my phone because it's always with me. So they are going to want more robust productivity, and I want to be the one that they think of when it comes to their relationships. Uh, and and so, so that's what I went about uh, doing. Owen was saying, I, I'm going to create a new category that we're calling mobile relationship management at a consumer price, $10, one-time cost to buy VIP Orbit. Uh, and have the power that formerly could only be gotten on a desktop computer now in the palm of your hand for only $10. And I'm going to appeal to all of those hundreds of millions of people. You know, ideally, it's going to take a lot of work to do it, but it, but that that's the vision. And we're going to create uh, more products for more platforms and get more functionally robust as we grow to appeal to more of that market and become, again, what we became with ACT, so to speak. And my personal goal, because you always set personal goals as an entrepreneur, right, yeah, is yeah. to make ACT look like an experiment. <laughs> well, I, well, I'm even curious, like, you, you sell it for $10, and you see a lot of these companies, the software as a service companies, they're doing this recurring revenue. Why are you guys deciding not to go in that direction? Maybe there's some insight you can share with us on that. Yeah, sure. No, that's pretty easy. We are going to have a subscription model, uh, shared database, and charge a monthly fee, just like everybody else. But uh, we're not going to charge the kind of money that the consumer is unwilling to pay, right? I mean, part of the reason there's only 12 million users of contact management at Sierra in the, in the world is because it's expensive uh, on a yearly basis or a monthly subscription basis. I mean, Salesforce is easily $100 per user per month. As an individual, as a small company, I can't afford myself to spend $1,200 a year for Salesforce. Now, you can get it vanilla package for $65 a month if you don't need a consultant or anything, but you can't do anything with the product. That's $730 a year, Owen. Are you willing to spend every year $730? Or would you rather spend something that gives you core, the core functionality on your phone for only 10 bucks? Now, I see the point, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so where I'm going is not their market. So think of a pyramid. Think of a massive pyramid. At the very top are these 12 million people. What I decided to do is go down to the bottom of the pyramid to all of this wide base of smartphone, presently iPhone users. There's 200 million of them presently, by the way. And uh, provide them a means to do relationship management and get them aware of and started with doing more with people than they can do in any other product. I mean, Facebook can't do what we do. Google can't do what we do. There are no other products that do what we do. It hasn't been developed yet. Uh, success creates competition, so I expect competition over time as I develop the market, but I'm going to be the leader in it uh, and do everything I can to maintain that leadership just like I did with ACT. And, and my, when I say I did, me and my team, right? Definitely. And, and because you're in a new market, there's higher risk, and then you're trying to tell people something that they're not aware of can be done. How are you bridging that gap to tell them the story or paint the need for them? It's one thing if it's something they know of another competition, uh, another competitive software out there, they know about it, and you can just compare uh, Groupon, Living Social, you know that those two are existing. So, but you are doing something that is new, and the market is not, you're basically building the market. How do you exactly. paint the story so that people can get involved and you know, join what you're doing and, and, and be consumers of your product? Well, uh, again, I'm going to go back to some of the personal philosophies as a user that I, I uh, have lived by in, in trying to be successful in my own career. You cannot be successful without uh, successfully developing close relationships with other people, right? And, and especially sustainable relationships. So 
Uh, I think that the uh, just like the laptop in its era was brand new and people thought, wow, I could keep all this stuff seamlessly integrated, my notes and activities, and they're attached to a person, past, present, and future. I can pull up everything I've done in the past. It's accurate. It's, it's uh, documented. It helps me be smarter. It helps me look t uh, more professional. I think more people are going to say that they want that capability as well as they want more from their phones and, and tablets. So, um, you know, you just then set out to say, uh, let's make it simple, let's make it powerful, uh, let's make it convenient, and let's make it inexpensive. And let's make it have a value proposition that is almost uh, 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 unable to be turned away. Because now I can say to people, uh, you have a choice. Look at my database. I can instantly call up on my phone the tiniest detail about people uh, on demand, and, and I'm accurate uh, over hundreds, if not thousands, of people. You can't even remember what you did last Wednesday. If I asked you on, tell me what you did last Wednesday with everybody you did something with and everything you recorded about those people in your mind, tell me everything you did last Wednesday. You can't. Yeah. Right, so you and I see each other. If we're if we're typical, let's say we encounter each other in six months. Oh, oh, and nice to meet you. When was it that we talked again? Gosh, was it was back in the summer sometime? And uh, oh yeah, we talked about so and so, and we're very loose on our details. But because we're both kind of the same, we disregard it. But now imagine I come up to you and say, Owen, you and I spoke on July first for over an hour on an interview, and we talked about. Uh, uh, the IBM story of the asking the guy for a skiing vacation and we talked about uh, how ACT came to be and the code name for ACT and we talked about Michael Jordan you know I have that detail you're gonna go wow most people don't have that type of uh, ability and look at you what, uh, how do you do it and I say I don't do it I don't have to do it anymore I have a tool that helps me do it and that tool is VIP orbit right and so right in front of you, I've got total recall and command of our relationship. Keep in mind, Owen, there's a dip, big difference between social media and relationship management. I'm on the relationship management side, and here's the distinction. Social media should really be called social me. It's all about me. How many friends do I have? How many followers do I have? I'm going to tell everybody what I'm doing. You know what? Who cares? I, you know, I mean, it, 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 who cares from a business standpoint? Because the key to that is, but you've got to convert your public persona down to some real meaningful one-on-one -on -one relationships for business purposes. If you just want it to all be social, fantastic. But how else are you going to make your living? Because we all have to make a living, right? Definitely, yeah. So, and everybody knows everything. So now, go back to that. What What distinguished me with that? business owner at IBM. What distinguished me was I asked him a question based on a personal bit of knowledge that the other people had but didn't use, right? Uh, so if they had all said when they all called him, how was your skiing vacation? And I also said that we would still be the same, right? Because they didn't and I did, I took a number of steps forward beyond them. And so the problem with social media is everybody knows the same thing. So we all come to you and we all say, oh, oh, and I know you're from Nigeria. Yeah, so what? Everybody else knows it too. Big deal. What do you want, right? And instead, I come to you and say, I know that you came here. I know you went to Texas Tech. I know you want to move to Miami. I mean, I know. <laughs> you're giving all the good details now. <laughs> right. No, but I'm saying I, I now know personal information about you that's about you, not me. Where the value of relationship management's focus is about you. And I have to bring value to you in order to prove that I'm worth and worthy of your trust to open up to me and, and provide me opportunities. I've got to show that I'm there for you. Just like that owner said, you're a professional. And I only like to deal with professionals. So I would say to people, again, you have a choice. You can continue doing business the way you're doing it now or there's a way to do it much more effectively and efficiently and successfully, what's your choice? Do you want to get ahead of your competition or not? Yes or no? Of course you probably do, right? Those aren't the questions that need to be asked because the answers are obvious. Of course people want to succeed. The real question to ask is, 
Is it okay to continue to fail? Is it okay to let competition always beat me? That might compel people more to say, uh, no, that's a scary thought. What can I do to prevent that from happening and succeed in the process? And that's what my product, VIP Orbit, is all about. It's helping people to succeed more effectively with the people they deal with. And the name of the product, VIP Orbit, VIP, everybody understands, very important person. We all have orbits. So you, Owen, could be in my uh, the radio uh, broadcast orbit. We might go to the same church together. We might belong to the same country club. Our, our uh, you know, kids might play on the same soccer team. You might be in five or 10 or 20 orbits, but I'm not going to forget you in any one of them because I easily categorize you that way. And so the, the definition of orbits is a person's sphere of resource and influence, according to Webster's Dictionary. Well, you are a sphere of resource and influence because... I do want VIP Orbit to succeed. You're going to help bring it to, uh, the attention of it to the market. But, I, but, but I'm bringing value to you, too, because you need people like me to bring things to the market so that they listen to you, right? Definitely. Your story has so, been very awesome, so, too. So one of the longest interviews I've done because I've been so, like, on my edge. Like, man, I want to give, to give all the story. It's been great. Yeah. So, so the, what's nice about this is we're both delivering value to each other. It, now, maybe there's no reason to continue to talk, but maybe when we come out with our iPad version in uh, in the fall, you want to interview me again, and we'll pick up right where we left off. As a right? matter of fact, we can do a, a demo interview, more of more, not, not really about your story, but more about the actual how uh, to use Orbit. Once you have the iPad version come off, we could do, I usually do, when I find cool tools, I do demos of it, because I'm always yeah. about productivity and how you can be mobile and do business and you know anywhere as long as you have internet access and the right tools to do it. So that will be a great interview to do. I mean, yeah, you you've been on the phone for uh, on, on the call with me for so long. I know you you you're busy. You have to go very soon. But I want you to leave a word of advice for any entrepreneur who's been you know listening to this so far. And you know, how can they take failures that they have in their business and turn that around for them? Well, you know, I. I, I I'm, I mean, there's a little bit of luck, right? Uh, there's definitely a lot of hard work. There's definitely a, uh, an, an enormous amount required to just persevere. In what's kind of torpedo is full speed ahead, right? I, I just have to accomplish my mission, as funny as that sounds, and a belief that you can. Uh, I, 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 the, fall the late 1800s, Mr. Diddy, uh, is quoted as saying, man can only be when he acts from his passions. Okay? Uh, let me repeat that. Yeah, man, I was having issues with Skype. I didn't want to, to stop you, but say that word again. All right. So Disraeli, the, the British philosopher of the late 1800s and who was prime minister, is quoted as saying, man can only be from his passions. Well, we've heard of people say, well, find your passion, find your passion. Well, that's not so easily done. I'm not pretending it is. But, but you do need to find it if you do want to be great. You have to. And so the first quest you have to, the, the first journey you have to take is to find that passion. That, and once discovered, now what can I do with it? And based on... Maybe it's only a local idea. It's a new pizza. It's a new kind of pizza restaurant. Okay, that's, that's as an entrepreneur. Maybe it's a software company. That's global, right? Uh, so there's ranges of what constitutes a vision, but it doesn't matter. Every one of those visions has passion, and, and you've got to find that and then grab onto it and begin to think like a user, which is what, in my case, always helped me. Why would I want this? What don't I like about it? What do I need that would make me, you know, bring more convenience uh, to my life? You do not think about money. You do not think about someday I'm going to, you know, have my 500-meter uh, yacht. You don't think about that stuff. I, would, I dream like other people, hey, wouldn't it be fun to have a corporate jet? Yeah, sure it would, but you know what? I don't have one, and I'm never going <laughs> to have one, right? You don't, but you don't think about that. Every day is, can I, can I succeed and survive another day? Can I build another brick? Can I put a, another layer of stone and start to build my, my, my edifice? 
can I can I get one more article written uh, that brings more attention to the market? You have to continue to think like that in small steps. You know, let's let's use football, American football, as an analogy, right? You don't make a touchdown automatically. You you earn the right to continue to try to make a touchdown by gaining ten yards at a time. So. Part of it is just think 10 yards at a time. Yes, I, I know where I want to get to. I want to get down to that goal line. But I'm going to get there 10 yards at a time. That's all my mission is today. So what do I have to do today, next week, next month, to, to move that ball 10 yards and buy myself some more opportunity? And, wow. and by doing that, you begin to, to uh, uh, cut a path uh, of widening opportunity to you if you persist, right? Now, you also have to have... <laughs> The, the financial means and investors, whatever, to believe in you uh, because some visions are going to cost a lot of money. But, hey, that's okay. That's what being an entrepreneur is about, too. Wow, Mike. I, this has been one of the most longest interviews I've had, but one of the most interesting ones because you, you had so much story. I'm like, I'm only <laughs> worried right now about the listener. I'm like, man, this is almost about an hour and 30 minutes. Wow. I don't know if they I, I want them to stay all the way to the end to enjoy this. And I really appreciate your time. I, I mean, I'm thankful of it. And how best can anyone who's been listening to this into this discussion all, all to this point, how can they get a hold of you? No, I appreciate that. Well, first of all, uh, you can go to our website, www.v, V is in violin, vIPorbit.com. Um, you can write me at mike at vIPorbit.com. Uh, they can get in touch with you and then you can let me know that somebody would like to speak to me and you've got my phone number so you can give me a call Owen and, and I invite you by the way to contact me anytime you want okay thank you very much so, Mike I really appreciate it yeah thanks for the interview they, um, we have a free version of VIP Orbit so if you're an iPad or iPhone user you can download the free version which is full function but it, it's only limited to the first hundred uh, contacts in your phone list so it's a try before you buy and then if you like it, you can upgrade to the uh, full version for $9.99. That's what would help. Thank you very much. As a matter of fact, I'm going to go get it for my iPhone. So I'll check it out. <laughs> Make sure that you know. Oh, and I offer you a personal tutorial. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Let me thank you in advance for downloading. When you do, I'll be happy to answer questions. So give me a call and say, hey, how do I do this or whatever. I don't understand that. I'll be happy to give you a personal tutorial. Thank you very much, Mike. Thanks for doing the interview. I appreciate it. You're welcome, Owen. Have a good one. Have a good July 4th. You too. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed today's interview. And before you go, I want you to do me a favor. I'm trying to build my community of entrepreneurs who find my content useful on Facebook so we can engage, you know, have discussions live right there on Facebook. And to get to my page on Facebook, you go to www.facebook.com forward slash hy. V-A-S-S-I-S-T-A-N-T. -S 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 and again, it's www.com. What am I saying? <laughs> no, it's www.facebook.com forward slash H-Y-V-A-S-S-I-S-T-A-N-T. -S -S and when you get there, what you're going to do is look for the uh, a button that says like. And you click on that button. And then basically you uh, become a... Uh, a fan of the page it's that simple you don't even have to leave me your email just click on the button that says like and again the page to go to is www.facebook.com forward slash h y v a s s i s t a n t and that stands for hive assistance real easy i look forward to seeing you on facebook have a great day